We now move to Book 4, Chapter 8, which is actually Smith's last chapter on mercantilism. It's entitled, appropriately, Conclusion of the Mercantile System. Smith recognizes that most of his discussion of mercantilism has talked about how mercantilism encourages exportation in order to have a favorable balance of trade. In this chapter, Smith will consider that mercantilism in some cases actually encourages importation. That will, of course, be for raw materials. If a country imports more raw materials, there is at least possibly the expectation that this will help with exports. Smith, however, still thinks that free trade will do better than the recipes of mercantilism, and it's again for the same reasons he's already outlined. Under free trade, market price signals encourage resources to be allocated where they're most valuable for producing goods and services for consumers. By the way, if you're wondering why this is a woodpile in the picture, it's because British law at the time of Smith encouraged the importation of wood from the colonies in order to produce goods for subsequent export. Smith also considers how the export of raw materials under mercantilism sometimes is discouraged. It is hoped that those raw materials stay at home to produce valuable goods and services for later export. One example Smith gives is British laws which made it harder to export wool to other countries. During this time, of course, wool is a major input behind British exports of textiles, which was a major economic sector. Smith gives some striking examples of just the lengths that regulation went to to attempt to discourage the export of wool in England. He talked about how wool by law could not be packed in any box, barrel, cask, case, chest, or any other package. You had to pack it in leather or pack cloth, and you had to put the words wool or yarn on the outside in large letters not less than three inches long. Furthermore, it was illegal to load the wool onto any horse or cart or carry that wool by land within five miles of the ocean, only between sunrising and sunsetting, Smith writing, quote, on pain of forfeiting the same, the wool, the horses, and carriages. Smith argued that the net result of all of this was simply that England produced less wool, and this was bad for the economy, bad for farmers, and in the longer run, also bad for textile exports. Toward the end of this chapter, there are some very nice passages about how economics should be oriented toward the consumption of goods and services. This is a very modern idea, and Smith was really the first economist to grasp and express it this fully, and I quote, Consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production, and the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. In the mercantile system, the interest of the consumer is almost constantly sacrificed to that of the producer. It's hard to get any clearer than that. And now comes the sting at the end, one of Smith's final conclusions about the mercantile system, and this reflects just how often public choice reasoning pops up in Smith, namely the notion that individuals pursue their self-interest and they often use government to pursue their self-interest in a way which is not good for the broader policy. And here's Smith writing on the mercantile system. And he writes, quote, It cannot be very difficult to determine who have been the contrivers of this whole mercantile system, not the consumers, but the producers.